Good morning, Olive Branch family, and welcome to our online service. We are so glad that you're able to join us on YouTube or on Facebook. And listen, January 2022 has been filled with snow and a lot of negative temperature weather. And oh my goodness, a lot of snow, a lot of shoveling. But there's been one positive, and that's been this series that Pastor Ken's been sharing on, on vows and promises. And today, to end it, the series, to cap it all off, he titled it Promise Keepers and Promise Killers. Woo! It's going to be an awesome, awesome series. Uh, way to end the series. So we hope that you enjoy and you have an awesome Sunday. God bless and we'll see you then. In the darkness we were waiting without hope from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Pray
Well, thank you so much for the time of worship. Helps us to bring our heads together. The ultimate promise keeper is God. He is the one who backs up. He's the foundation for all the promises that we make. And of course, that's what we've been talking about, promises. Now, I know it's entitled vows, but vows are making and keeping promises. Let's talk a little bit about where we've been so far in this whole series of talks. What we want, what everybody wants, is we want to be seen as a trustworthy person, for people to take what we say and say, I believe what you're saying. So for that to happen, there has to be trust, but it has to be worthy, and worthy has to do with the weight, the weight of our words, that when we keep them, they actually have some weight to them. We keep our promises because of God, that character integrity starts with God's promises and God's character. So for us, there has to be some kind, if we say, trust me, well, there has to be some kind of sense that we are trustworthy, which is the fact that we have some kind of history of keeping our promises. Very, very important. So that was kind of the foundation of all that we talked about. We, you know, talked about the fact that sometimes we say, well, it's it's not a vow, it's just a promise. And that was exactly what Jesus had to get after, was the fact that, you know, people had kind of classified their vows or classified their promises. You know, you had your really, your gold promises, which were the really big ones, really important. Silver, not quite so big, but still important. Then you had bronze, yeah, they're kind of middle of the road, but you have to keep them. Then wood promises, well, not such a big deal. And then, of course, in our culture, plastic promises. So, we have, we can't just, you know, categorize all these, you know, in terms of, you know, whether or not we're going to keep them. A promise is a promise. Jesus said, if you are saying yes, then mean yes, do yes. If you mean no, then do no. Whatever, we, whatever you're going to do, just make sure that you do what you say you're going to do. What happens is that when we don't keep our promises, that creates pain in other people. And what happens then in their consciousness, whenever you experience pain, there's kind of avoidance memories. I don't want to get burned again, you know? And so our believability, then there's kind of a traffic light in their mind where they say, don't do it, don't believe him, you know? Or be very, very careful, you know? He could break his promises. Or yell or green, go for it. So that's kind of what goes on in people's minds in terms of whether or not we have kept our promises and what it means to go on. We talked about our marriage vows. We talked about the fact that love isn't something that you just kind of sit there as a passive person and have it ex- and experience it. That love is actually an action verb. Action verb. Love is kind. Love is patient. It's not irritable. It doesn't keep a record of wrong. So love is something that we do. There's kind of a workout ethic to it. And what happens is people sometimes go into marriage thinking, you know, well, you know, I've, I have all these things. It's kind of like this box here, you know, and they're thinking, you know, well, I, I get all these promises in this box, and yet when you open it, there's nothing there. Actually, marriage is kind of love university. It's kind of a forge where love is formed in our hearts. It's a crucible where all the impurities are burned out. It's where you learn how to love, and it's difficult because there are these challenges. You know, marriage means that you have to learn how to love. Men and women are very different. You know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Their needs are very different. You know, say you have 10 needs, you know, the ones that guys would choose are like different, totally different than what women would choose. There are you know, different love languages, you know. Then there's family of origin, kind of the job description that people come with. And then there's, you know, the formula that the Bible gives, you know. It says that, you know, that a man will leave his father and mother. In other words, the actually the main word for children is to leave, and for a couple it's to cleave. We live in a sexualized culture, you know. We live in a disposable kind of Kijiji world, you know. If it doesn't work out, sell it, get something new. And then we live in a self-obsessed culture. So what happens sometimes in marriages, you know, there's this downward spiral of neglect and disrespect. You know, you nag me. You don't say you love me. You ignore me. You put me down. You don't talk. You never hug me. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't. And before long, the whole thing has kind of crashed and burned. So that's kind of where we've been so far. Today I want to talk about promise keepers and promise killers. And there's a difference between those two words and what makes us one or the other. So let me just kind of start here. Right around this time of year, uh, back in 2014, you know, Lori and I um, 
ended up with a mess at our family cottage. You know, we got really, really cold like it was last week, and I decided, okay, better go up and check this out. Got up there. The front door window was all frosted up. Went through the door. Water's running down the steps. There's like 10 inches of water down in the furnace room. It had shut down the furnace. So I did what anybody would do in those circumstances. I took my blankie, and I curled up in a corner and sucked my thumb and cried. Lori said, come on, man, Ken, be a man. (laughs) Actually, I immediately called our insurance company, and I had the number right there, told them what had happened, and they assured me that this was covered. So then they gave me the person that they call to come and clean things up. I called that person. They said, better call them and make sure that this is actually covered by insurance. So I called them back. Yes, it's covered. So they came in, and I'll tell you, I felt like the weight of the world had lifted off my shoulders that day. They came in, started cleaning up, started drying things out and so on. And then when it came time to actually have to rebuild, they said, you better call them again. So I called them again. And this time, the insurance company said, nah, you know, fine print tells us that we don't have to do that for you. I was angry, and I was frustrated. Now, how many of you have ever been in a situation like that? where, you know, somebody promised that they were going to do something and said, yes, 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 and then no, and canceled out the thing. When that happens, man, it just creates pain, makes you angry. And that's why Jesus said, you know, keep your promises. You don't need to make all kinds of oaths and stuff, and you don't need, you know, guns and lawyers to get you to keep your promises. Say yes if you mean yes. Say no if you mean no. Now, here's the question, Okay. Why would the insurance company not do what they promised that they were going to do? Well, very easy answer. Money. Costs money to fix things up. And that's actually what happens when it comes to us keeping our promises. It's something that happens that turns us, you know, when we break a promise, all of the trustworthiness leaks out. Unless we do something, we remain in a deficit when it comes to being a trustworthy person. Self is really what drives this in us. Well, it's more money than I thought. Well, it's inconvenient for me. I'm about to get into bed. I don't want to come and help you. You know, it takes time and effort. I'm not prepared. So, and that's the question. Who comes first, you or the person that you promised? And in our world, (laughs) it's pretty much... I come first. Of course I do. Now, Jesus is relentless, uh, you know, uh, in the difference between what is right and what our culture sometimes says. The culture that he lived in, you know, that basically they had, you know, they followed the Bible, but they had all this stuff that surrounded it that, you know, cluttered it up, kept them from keeping their promises. Jesus puts it like this. Again, you heard that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. Why would he say that? He says all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. In other words, all the fancy stuff that you put around it, you know, to promise you're going to do it and, and all this stuff, he says you don't need that. Now, the good thing about the culture that Jesus came from was that they had, you know, Moses' promises, 1,500 years of following the promises, the the teachings of Moses, okay? Well, that was also the bad thing about the culture because then they had 1,500 years to figure out all the loopholes. And I'm telling you, they figured them out because there were like, you know, 630 commands and then unbelievable number of all these sub-commands and all these excuses why you didn't do it. Now, What you do when keeping your word costs you more than what you want to pay. That's why we don't many times keep our promises. You know, you find a different way to interpret it. You find you could find an escape clause, you know, find an exit ramp and so on. You find some sneaky way to get out of keeping your promises. And that's why Jesus said, just say yes, mean yes, do yes, or say no, mean no, and do no. Now, we live in a culture that's very different from Jesus because they assumed that God existed and so on, that he had made things. That's not our culture. Our culture is based on what could be called atheistic evolution, and it gets taught pretty much, you know, from every grade 8 science and biology class right on up through, you know, multiple levels of university. And the basic assumption is that, you know, 13, 13.8 billion years ago, there was Big Bang, 
I believe that, okay? Because you can see it, that's factual. And that suddenly, you know, the earth and everything else, all the sun, stars, everything pretty much came into being and so on. And we can see how long ago it was because of how far it's expanded. I believe that. And in the atheistic evolution part of this, though, the assumption is that life just kind of came out. You know, there were one-celled organisms, and then it just kept on growing and evolving and everything like that until you have human beings today. So it's kind of survival of the fittest. And, you know, if you were, you know, growing something that shouldn't be, it wouldn't grow, and it just kept on going like that, and so you end up with human beings. What that means, though, the ultimate meaning of that is if God had absolutely nothing to do with this, then morality is just a human invention. Morality has no meaning at all. And if that's true, then what runs our world is something that Richard Dawkins called the selfish gene, okay? And if that's true, then promises actually were made to be broken. There's no morality in either keeping your promises or not keeping them, you know? There's nothing ethical about whether you, you know, love your child and hug them or beat them. It, it just doesn't make any difference because there is no such thing as morality. And what happens is where we live kind of the top of the wedding cake of me is we live in a selfie world. Basically, if it works for me, that's great. If what works for me doesn't work for you, too bad, you know? Sucks to be you. So, you and I should not be surprised by the breaking of promises in a selfie world. We should not be surprised that a Bernie Madoff, you know, who basically, you know, cheats people out of billions of dollars, you know, basically did that. Because, you know, if morality is, is really irrelevant, then we shouldn't be surprised. He obviously thought he could get away with it, and he did for a while, and so on. So that's the way it works. The problem is he got caught. We shouldn't be surprised, you know, that Jeffrey Epstein and Bill Cosby and R. Kelly would do what they did because they're wired to do that, right? To, you know, procreate, to make sure that their genes, you know, carry on. And what I'm saying is this, in a world that officially does not believe in God or that we are accountable to Him or that we are accountable for morality or that we are accountable for keeping our promises, living in a selfie world means that you're going to get promises that are made to you that are broken simply because it's inconvenient to keep them, simply because it costs too much money, simply because the person does not feel like doing it. Now, if you believe that, you know, you're the master of your own ship, and how you live is your business and, and no one else's, then what Jesus said here doesn't apply to you. It, it just doesn't, okay? I get that. The question I'd like to ask, though, is that the kind of world that you want to live in? You know, where basically people only keep their promises if they want to, or if they're forced to do that. See, I personally think that this leads to anger and frustration and, and chaos, because trust becomes irrelevant. And into this world, Jesus said this, okay, about this whole thing. He put it like this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Now, if you don't believe in Jesus, then, you know, this, you're not necessarily accountable to this. But if you do believe in Jesus, then this is for you. This is for me, okay? Jesus makes it clear that the selfish gene is definitely part of our DNA. That becomes clear at the very beginning. Now, is there anybody here who's never felt it, okay? You've never thought to yourself, well, I want to keep my money for myself. This is inconvenient for me. I don't feel like doing this. Anybody who's never felt that, just raise your hand. Oh, that's right. can't see you, Okay. Because this is normal, but I'm telling you, it is the most destructive urge in life. And if you follow it, it will wreck your relational world because nobody will be able to trust you. You will come first in everything, and nobody wants to be around a person like that. Jesus will always attack this drive in us for us to be number one, look out for number one. Now, Jesus didn't just leave us in this negative world, you know, of what we shouldn't do. He pushes us toward unselfishness. He says, this is how you want to live. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love others as you love yourself. And you know what that means, right? There's nobody who likes to have their promises broken, nobody who likes to get a promise and find out that it's just an empty box. 
Everybody likes it when people keep their promises. And Jesus is basically saying, if you want people, you know, if that's what you like, then do that for other people. It only makes sense. Now, our culture tells us that there really is no center line down the highway, you know, and that truth is just kind of a power play to manipulate people and so on. Now, Jesus countered this. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. So who's right? Our culture has institutionalized self-interest. Looking out for number one is pretty much normal behavior. Now, here's the deal. The interesting thing in our culture is that even though this is declared to be normal, nobody admires this. <laughs> nobody likes to hang out with people, you know, who look out for number one all the time. Jesus' verdict on this way of life is, you know, you can gain the whole world, man. You can make a lot of money, and you can get a lot of promise, you know, prestige and success, but you can lose your soul lose yourself. When you continually break promises because they inconvenience you, this wrecks your relational world. And we need our relational world. We need relationships of love with other people. Self wrecks peace. And you know what the Bible teaches is summarized by Paul. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Notice what the last word there is. Everyone. Not just the people who please you, not just the people that you like, not just the people that you haven't made promises to. It's with everyone. Now, <clears throat> the way this works is this, okay? Let me just kind of illustrate this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But integrity means that what I say is who I am. If I say I'm going to do something, I do it because it's part of who I am. Disintegration is basically what I say you know, and who I am, self gets in there. Self forms this wedge between that. In fact, you could put it like this if you would like to, that there is kind of a selfie wedge that comes between us and other people. And it honestly, it always comes between us and other people. Where self in our life gets inserted into our lives, it either makes us either promise killers or promise keepers. You understand that, right? Like if self is the biggest deal in your life, it will turn you either into a promise, you know, a, a promise killer. If you don't let it, do, let it do that, then you will be a promise keeper. Now, think about this statement, okay? I promise to make life convenient and enjoyable. Now, how you end that sentence makes all the difference in the world, you know? If you finish it with, you know, for you and others, I promise to make life convenient and enjoyable for you and others, then that turns you into a magnificent person who thinks about others and put them first. But there is a world of difference between, you know, I promise to make life convenient and enjoyable for me, okay? And I'll tell you what that does, you know, if, you, if that's your kind of your motto in life, then you put you right down with all the other bottom feeders like Harvey Weinstein. Think about this. I promise to always shop for the best deal. And if it's finished with for you, if you're married, I promise to always shop for the best deal. I promise to always look out for your interests. If you finish it with, I always will look out for the best deal for me. Well, then that turns you into an unpredictable friend. Because you see, if that's, your if that's what your friendship is based on, then somebody, you can make promises to somebody, and they're, they know that you're out shopping for the best deal. And if you get a better offer, that's the one you're going to go with, and you're just going to crush the promise that you made to them. It turns you into a promise killer. There's another line uh, that, that I hear. You know, you can count on me. And you know, if we're a trustworthy person, the person that hears that thinks, okay, if I call on you, if I need you and I call on you, I can count on the fact that you're going to be there, that you're going to come. But if you aren't, then what people hear is, okay, I, you can count on me for what? To look out for yourself? To choose the most convenient path? To avoid me, you know, when I, bar when, you know, you know, when you borrow money from me? To look out for number one and evade everything else? See, how you answer those questions makes a big deal of difference. And what Jesus says here makes huge relational sense, and it deals with this self-issue. The thing that makes all these huge promises, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. That's part of the deal. 
See, we're used to people denying themselves in other arenas, right? You probably know somebody who's denying themselves food and candy and stuff like that right now because they want to look really good this summer for beach season, really hot. Sometimes people will deny themselves, you know, vacations and time with their family and even sacrifice their families to get ahead, you know, to make more money, you know, to get career advancement. We're used to that. I have a, a good friend, Jim Hunter. He was one of the, you know, one of the Olympic guys back in, you know, 1972 to 1976. You remember the crazy Canuck ski team, you know? They actually, his name was Jungle Jim. They actually made a documentary movie about his training routine. He'd curl up in the inside of a rim of a tractor and ride that so he would learn how to keep his balance. I mean, just crazy. They called him Jungle Jim. And so, you know, people have to do that if they want to be really good at music or really good at acting or really good at something else. But Jesus asks an audacious question in this passage. He says, would you live for me with that kind of an intensity and, and determination? Different thing, isn't it? Will you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind? Will you love other people as you love yourself? Will you treat other people as you would like to be treated? Big question. So here's my challenge to me and to you. You're familiar with marriage vows, right? Some of you have taken them and so on. So think about this. What if you were to say those same marriage vows to God? Think about that, okay? Last week in my message on marriage vows, I mentioned that God describes himself as a divorcee, okay? And he says this, and he says this through the prophet Jeremiah, I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. Paul, who's an early Christian leader, you know, he also taps into this imagery, especially in talking about husbands and wives, you know, when it, and how he compares, you know, the uh, church, the people of God, to the bride being the bride of Christ. This is what he says. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything that he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. It's a huge mystery, and I don't pretend to understand it all. What is clearest to me is the way that Christ treats the church. And this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself and loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. So what is clear in this imagery is that God's promises and commitment to us are kind of like the vows between a husband and wife, the vows that they take when they get married. Now, if you uh, have ever pursued that, you know, first there's the, you know, pursuing, you know, and usually one pursues the other. Sometimes one, you know, kind of hides the fact that they're pursuing, you know, and so they, there's this dance back and forth. And then there's the getting to know each other phase, you know, and this takes some time, you know, and in that time we ask questions like, is this person for real? Like, are they really real? Or am I kind of getting, you know, the Instagram version of them that's all buffed up, you know, and, and, uh, and airbrushed? What's under the surface of their lives? Are they real? Can I really trust them? Do they have integrity and character? Do they do what they say they're going to do and not do the things that they say they're not going to do? Those are the things that you find out in this period. And, and then there's the question that you have to ask. Will I still be glad that I marry them two years from now, four years from now, eight years from now, okay? Is there enough substance there to build a life together when the love drugs wear off? Because they will. So, and do we have a common set of values? Do we have the same center line down our highway? Do we have the same place that we go to when life falls apart? Are we going to go in different directions? And then, of course, there's the question, will they keep their promises? Will they keep their promises? Will they love me as I am? Or after we get married, will they then expect me to become somebody else, somebody I can't be? And when we're in the process of learning to trust Jesus, those are some of the questions that we have to ask. Is Jesus for real? Or is he kind of like an ad for the church, you know? Is what he said about life real? Does it fit into real life? Or is it just, you know, something he made up because it sounded good, you know? Is he going to, once, once I come to him, is he going to then demand things that I can't possibly do and make my life miserable? Those are things that people ask themselves. And the first thing you need to understand is that Jesus is not a religion. In fact, he disliked religion probably as much or more than we did. 
Jesus invited people to come just as they are. That's why people came, all kinds of people. People who didn't come, actually, were the religious people. People who came were people whose lives had fallen apart and gone in lots of different directions. He says this, and this is a paraphrase. He says in Matthew 11, he says, Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll receive your life. I'll show you how to take a rest, a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. That's quite a promise, isn't it? And the question you have to ask is, is that real? Is that a real promise? Then Jesus did what no other you know, husband or wife could possibly do. He proved his love and proved his unconditional, you know, commitment to us by being humiliated and beaten and then nailed to a cross. Nobody else has done that. Just for me. Did that for you and he would do it again. And right before this, he promised his disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them, you know, so that they could come where he was. And what's interesting, again, he uses kind of the marriage language. That's what husbands did back in that culture. They went and either built an addition onto their parents' house or they went out and built a house so that, you know, when they got married, they would have a place to live. It's fiancé language. Now, I know this might all be a little strange, you know, if it's new for you, but the imagery is there for purpose. And the purpose is to show that Jesus' love is intimate. It's not formal. It's not clinical. He's not asking us to sign on to some religion. He's asking us to love him because he wants to love us. I'll tell you, it is the most profound relationship in the world, and it encloses some of the most powerful promises and vows that are attached to it. And the implications of this relationship say that Jesus, the Son of God, the one who made everything, the one who has always existed, thoroughly commits himself to us. And that his love is not just some pantsing romance. He's not infatuated with us. He's willing to walk the aisle with us and be faithful to us. Sometimes, even when we're unfaithful to him. Now, as you know, sometimes people get married out of purely selfish reasons. Probably the, you know, the bottom feeder version of this was back in 2000 when they came up with the show, you know, Who Wants to Marry a Millionaire? And I'd like to say, well, Hitler was a millionaire, you know, and so was Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> but that, so the question is, would you want to be married to somebody who just basically wants to marry you because of your money? That's a pretty scummy reason, right, to marry somebody. Now, here's what I'm going to, where I'm going with this. You know, to invite Jesus to be a part of your life just so that you can get what he has and then you can just do whatever you want, no matter who it hurts, would be a little bit like that. And the truth is that we need him. <laughs> we need Jesus. We sometimes won't admit it, but we need him. We want the life that he offers. And, you know, many times can offer very little in return, but that's not what he's looking for. He's not looking for what can you give me. We can give him something, and that's our lives. And when we do, he changes our lives. We offer our vows, you know, to him, even though we struggle with the ability and the desire to keep them. Now, if you're married, or if you've been to a wedding, or if you've heard a marriage on TV or anything like that, think about some of the marriage vows that people make, okay? So I'm just going to kind of personalize this. So it starts out with people basically making vows to God before an all-knowing God and in the presence of these witnesses, will you, and in my case, Ken Davis, take Lori Atherton, here present, to be your wedded wife? Will you love and comfort her? Will you honor and keep her and in joy and sorrow preserve with her this wedding bond? holy and unbroken until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ or God by death shall separate you. Now, Lori made these promises to me and I made them to her in good faith. You know, but neither of us had any idea of how hard this was going to be. I mean, you know, I struggle to see myself this way, but you know, I was sometimes stubborn and selfish and difficult and untrustworthy. And the fascinating thing is that Jesus, Son of God, he knows the future. He sees it as clearly as he sees the present. And he still promises us. He still promises us. Vows of love. Now here's where I'm going. Have you ever vowed and promised your love and your faithfulness to him? Have you ever done that? You know, in the passage I read earlier, Jesus said that to be his, that you need to deny yourself and take up your cross 
That is, know that it will not always be easy and follow him, even when it's inconvenient. So you look at some of these promises. Will you love him? Will you just offer him your love? You know, will you comfort him? You think, how am I supposed to comfort God? He doesn't need my comfort. But think about this. You know, Jesus said that when people who are thirsty and people who are hungry and people who don't have shelter and people who are sick or in prison, when they come to you, he said, and you love them and you give them what they need, he says, you're doing that for me. And so maybe the promise would be, will you comfort those that I send your way because I love them and I love you? Will you honor and keep him? In other words, will you plan to honor who he is and keep who he is front and center, keep his will front and center in your life? And finally, will you preserve this bond that you have with him, this relationship that you have with him, even when it gets difficult? You know, even when, you know, you're insanely happy and at peace and when difficulty hits you and you don't have a clue what it's about and you're angry and frustrated. Will you, with his help, and he gives us his, our, our, his help in these circumstances, will you keep your promises, be faithful until you pass from this life and into his arms? If your wedding was like most, then you turned and faced each other. This is a very emotional moment. Most husbands and wives can't do this without at least one of them you know, getting tears in their eyes, sometimes sobbing and crying, and you promise each other. In this moment, you know, Lori handed her flowers to her maid of honor. In this case, it was a matron of honor, her sister. And she held my hand and promised, I, Lori, take you, Ken, to be my wedded husband. I love you as I love no other. All that I am, I share with you. I take you to be my husband through sickness and health and through poverty and plenty, through joy and sorrow, now and forever. That's quite a promise. I can guarantee you that when she made this promise to me, she had no idea what lay ahead. (laughs) She had no idea what it meant when I said, all that I am, I give to you, I share with you. It's like, I'm not sure I want all that you are, you know? She had no idea what that meant, what that promise was all about, you know, because it was a struggle. We have struggled like every other couple. That's the struggle of marriage, though, isn't it? It's promising, I'm going to give this everything I've got. I'm going to give this relationship everything I have. And then you get discouraged. You feel like you're the only one who's making any effort sometimes. And as you know, easy to say. It's easy to say on the day when all your family are there, you know, and so on, and you're looking better than you have ever looked in your life and probably better than you ever will look again in your life, you know, and you have your life ahead of you. You have everything ahead of you. But when you're, what about when you're sick? What about when you have the barfing flu? What about when you have COVID? All that I am, I give to you, no matter what happens. What about when you lose your job? You have to downsize, you have to move. What about when you can't buy the things that you want? What about when, you know, money seems to be this carrot that's out in front of you and you're always chasing it and never finding it? Will you love God and will you be faithful when he doesn't make you rich and when he doesn't make you the success that you always dreamed that you would be and give you plenty to spare? Will you still love and follow Jesus when you're grieving the loss of somebody that you love? And that's the thing, isn't it? We make promises, interestingly enough, like this to a human being. <laughs> I mean, people, thousands, tens of thousands of people make these promises every week, but they know that they're going to fail. They know that they're not going to look the same for the next 30 years, you know. Sometimes we know that they're going to have secrets in their lives that we know nothing about. We know that they're going to be someone who at times, you know, screws up and makes bad decisions and is selfish and mean and and impatient and unkind. We we know that (laughs) because that's kind of what we're like. And so here's the question. Would you be willing to make those vows to someone who went to a cross for you and who would do it again? Someone who has always existed. Somebody who is full of kindness and full of compassion and full of mercy, always patient, and will never fail you. Always accept you. Never demand from you what you can't give, but will always be there for you never divorced you. And that's what I would like to end this series on vows with. You know, like all love promises, this takes time. 
Would you think about promising yourself to God as you learn, learn to live with his patience and with his kindness and his commitment that he will give you what you need to live this out? Would you be willing to do that? Before the all-knowing God, I can take you, Jesus, as my partner in life. And I will love you and comfort those that you love and send my way. And with your help, I will honor who you are. And I will keep your name and your glory front and center of my life until I die, or until you come to take me, me to be with you forever. It's my promise. Jesus, I love you as I love no other. All that I am, I give to you. I will love you and follow you in sickness and in health and in joy and in sorrow and in poverty and in plenty now and forever. To do this, Jesus said that you have to do something with self in your life. You have to walk it to the cross because that's where it belongs, you see. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. When we make our promises to God, and I would urge you to think about that really strongly. That's your homework. Think about it. What would it be to take the marriage vows that you would like to make to somebody else or you already made to somebody else or, you know, that in the past you made to somebody else? What if you were to make those same promises to God, knowing that he will give you his power to live them out? Let's pray. God, I pray that you will give us the courage to walk self to the cross. That's what we want other people to do because when people become selfish and self-preoccupied and self-interested and all the other little ugly children that self has, it makes it difficult to be around. We don't want to be like that. When it comes to the end of our lives, we want you to be able to say, well done. When it comes to the end of our lives, we want people to be able to say there wasn't a selfish bone in their body like they gave their lives for other people. Help us, God, to live in ways that we will be glad that we lived. Help us to make our promises with you giving your power to help us to keep them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're gonna worship and then when we come back, I just have some words for you to take with you. You reach from the sky. of your grace I could not afford my guilt has been erased now I'm forever yours no oh, what a price you paid trading the highest place lay down your crown Yours is a victory. 
Would you think about making promises to God, the same kind of promises that you would make to somebody else, you know? Before the all-knowing God, I promise to honor and keep you and love you and cherish the relationship that I have with you. And then to love God and to live for Him and in His name to walk self to the cross where it belongs. So may God keep his hand on you. May God give you his power to keep the promises. And may God make us unselfish and kind and patient and gracious people. Amen.